I could not help wondering during that piece how many times Dr. Harris and Dr. Seadot had watched that movie with their toddlers. <laughs> I started watching it again this week, but I didn't get to finish it. So now, of course, I will have to go home and finish it today. Well, it does feel so good to be back this morning. Two months is a long time to be away. And while I am so thankful for the time to recover from my surgery and to take a little sabbatical, I was so ready to come back to this place. This place that for me and for all of us, whether we come from near or from far. Many of you have been asking what I did with my time away. I did give some thought to making it sound more glamorous than it actually was. Because in full disclosure, I did absolutely nothing. <laughs> and doing absolutely nothing was surprisingly easy and truly wonderful. Some of you know I run at a pretty fast pace most of the time. Granted, my job as senior minister and CEO of First Church is a big job, and I am a person who is always pushing forward. So for me to let go, walk away, and unwind my usual pace of life seemed like a huge undertaking. And yet... I took to it like a fish to water. One of the wisdom teachers I adore, Thich Nhat Hanh, said, we have a tendency to think in terms of doing and not in terms of being. We think that when we are not doing anything, we are wasting our time. But that is not true. Our time is first of all for us, he says, to be, to be alive, to be peaceful, to be joyful, to be loving. And that is what the world needs most. Reading this quote again as I entered into the second week of being away gave me all the permission I needed just to be. I did think many times during those days of the desert mothers and fathers because in essence, I became a hermit. I didn't see anybody. I didn't go anywhere. We often think of hermits as people who live in solitude for religious discipline. But did you know there is another class of hermits. In the magnificent beauty of tropical forests, groups of hummingbirds can be found deep in the shady lower layers where they forge along regular routes. These hummingbirds are known as hermits. I developed a kindred spirit with those hummingbirds because over the weeks, I did feel like I was living in the lower layers of something. Not something unpleasant. In fact, I had a sense that this time was going to produce a fruitful and fulfilling purpose in my life. So as I let go, I discovered once again how much meaning can be found in just being alive, being peaceful, being joyful, and being loving. Those days of an unknown journey became healing for me in a myriad of ways. Through the centuries of our faith traditions, the ancestors have set out on journeys without knowing how their lives would be changed. Our story this morning of Naomi and Ruth has always been one of my favorite examples of the ways in which journeys can be life-changing. 
Naomi, the matriarch in this story, was already a seasoned woman of the journey. We are told she had left her homeland with her husband and her sons, looking for a place of safety and security, a place where there was enough. And while they did find all of those things in a land that was not their own, sadly, all three men in Naomi's life died. Their deaths affected not only her, but also her son's wives, who were both childless. Perhaps not wanting them to feel responsibility for her, Naomi decided to return to her ancestral home and free her son's wives to begin their lives again. One of them, as we heard, decided to stay. The other decided to journey with Naomi and to partner with her into a narrative that would lead into a new future. A future whose effect would transcend thousands of years and eventually find Ruth becoming the mother of the line of kings of the Hebrew people and eventually to be named in the lineage of Jesus. So Ruth chose a sacred pathway and found a life of meaning. I've come to believe over the years that all pathways have the potential for sacredness. Throughout history, we have been led to believe that sacred things only happen in certain places. Yet together, we are learning what the ancients knew deep in their bones. Together, we are realizing once again, the whole earth is sacred and is imbued with the divine spirit of life and love just like those words Michael spoke for James' baptism this morning. It can be difficult in times like ours to continue believing this sacred truth when we see decisions being made from a quest for power rather than love. Decisions that will lead to despair and to destruction. Yet the motivation of our hearts and our capacity to love always provides the opportunity to discover sacred pathways that will create lives of meaning. Lives of meaning for us as individuals and for those whose lives are interwoven with our own. This past week, a woman who understood what it meant to live a life of meaning died. She was a woman whose journey in life forged a sacred pathway that gave our world and our time amazing gifts that stirred our souls. Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan died at the age of 81 on Tuesday, and she left behind a legacy that was formed at the intersection of music and activism. Dr. Reagan promoted black history and culture as a scholar, performer, composer, and producer. In reporting on her life, the Washington Post reminded us first of her accomplishments. She received a PhD in history from Howard University, taught as a professor at American University, worked as a curator at the Smithsonian Institution, and explored the development of African-American sacred music. She wrote in some linear notes in her 1965 solo album, Folk Songs of the South, that her history had been wrapped carefully for her by her foreparents in the songs of the church, the work fields, and the blues. In these notes, she described this incredible moment of self-revelation. With that discovery, she realized she had been trying to find herself by using the first music she'd ever known as a basic foundation for her search for truth. The journalist Harrison Smith wrote how Reagan's life as an activist began. The year was 1961. She was only 19 and was a student in Georgia at Albany State College. 
He writes, she quickly gained a reputation as a gifted organizer and performer, going to jail for her activism and singing spirituals and protest songs that fortified her colleagues in the Southern Nonviolent Coordination Committee. At one of the meeting's first mass meetings, when she was asked to lead the group in song, she started out on a well-known spiritual. Over my head, I see trouble in the air. But she decided the lyrics weren't right for the occasion. So she swapped trouble for freedom. Over my head, I see freedom in the air. By the second line she recalled, everyone was singing those words. At marches and in jailhouses, music and liberation songs went hand in hand, and she was the voice that was often leading those songs. Her work as a scholar and activist continued throughout her life at universities, at protests, in concert venues, and in houses of worship. The freedom songs she led were often revamped versions of spirituals, spirituals that were familiar to anyone who had grown up in African-American churches. And she was not afraid to change some lyrics in those songs. Many times, she said, I simply replaced the word Jesus with freedom. She was definitely a woman after my own heart in changing words. And in reality, we all know Jesus and freedom are actually the same word. I know of Bernice Johnson Reagan's life because of Sweet Honey in the Rock. You heard one of the pieces this morning during the baptism. And even though she had retired from the group she founded by the first time I saw them in concert, her music had been the lifeblood of those women. One of the sweet truths of Sweet Honey in the Rock is that from the beginning, every member of the group contributed to their arrangements. Every member. If you've never heard them, you have no idea what those arrangements were like and how intricate that music was. So beautifully woven together. When I thought about that again this week and this day as we talk about partnership, I realized, my friends, that is the way you practice partnership. First time I heard them in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I cried through at least 75% of that concert, really cried during the song for the baptism. It was like going to a revival, a word we don't use much anymore. But it was life-changing, and it came at a, at a pivotal time in my life. Later in Reagan's life, she explained that being in Sweet Honey in the Rock was the most aggressive growing experience she'd had in her life. Bernice became the matriarch that led her sisters to share their hearts and spirits with everyone who found themselves needing a home. Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan's life was one filled with meaning. It was a life that found a sacred pathway and stayed on that journey for all of her 81 years on this earth. There is a simple old phrase that said, that says, it is better to go together than to go alone. While the weeks away were precious and needed, I could not wait to get back to doing life with all of you. Because in these days, we are those busy hermit hummingbirds 
foraging for the nourishment of this time and place and using it to create sweet lives of meaning. As we travel this sacred pathway together on this day, let us remember the best is now and still to come. May it be so.